Recently in the news, it was reported that two Van Goghs that had been stolen over 14 years ago had been found on a drug bust at a farm in Italy. Um, the titles of the paintings, they aren't some of Van Gogh's most famous work, but they're Van Gogh's, so I mean they're really valuable. And it seems that it's often used in the drug trade that works of art will serve as sort of collateral for large drug deals. And so somebody's bought a bunch of drugs, they don't have enough cash to tide them over, they have to sell their product before they can pay off their supplier. And so a priceless piece of art is held by a drug dealer. Uh, it seems really odd because they can't actually sell the art. I mean, the minute it came on the market, everything would go nuts and there's no auction house in the world that could handle a piece of stolen art. But it's seen as having sort of this intrinsic worth and somehow it secures the deal. Um, it's sort of odd to think about transactions like that. But to recognize that there are certain things that have intrinsic worth I don't know if you ever reflect on what your retirement accounts look like, but I'm looking at a piece of paper that has a list of numbers that represents investments that I don't really understand that are promised to me at a time I'm not really sure of, and I'm happy or sad, depending on what it says in the envelope and how I did last year it seems sort of odd that this thing that seems to have no real value, I mean, they're numbers on a piece of paper. That's what the future is pinned on for many of us, are those numbers and how things are going on the piece of paper. But to know that there are things that have intrinsic worth, that's a good place for us to start today. And we start a long time ago. We start back probably 730 years before the time of Jesus. And the northern part of the land of Israel had been increasingly um, oppressed by an Assyrian government to their north. Bad things had come from the north and it had worked oppression on the peoples in that part of the country. And the prophet says, you know, this is going to turn around. And this land that now belongs to somebody else, they're going to get a gift from God. Now, this is years before the time of Jesus. These are scriptures that are familiar because we hear them at Christmas time. And if we do the math on this, it would be a little odd for me to say something like, we are going to make some changes in our church life, and I promise 750 years from now, we will all be glad we did. Uh, I, I guess I couldn't drum up a bunch of support for that. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think it would happen. But this promise that hangs out in the future has an intrinsic worth because it tells us about the character of the God who carries out these promises, the character of the God that we worship. And we learn something deeply important about God's intention for the world as we look at this passage from Isaiah. And it says that people who are not like us, and that would have been the nation of Israel, are part of God's great plan. And that place where we never want to go, the sea, that's going to be a place where God's good news is made real. The light's going to come on for those people because of the thing that God does. It wouldn't hurt us to think like that for just a minute. Who are the people that we don't care about? And where are the places 
that we never want to go. And we could figure those out. I was in Cleveland not too long ago. Um, turns out it's better than everybody says. It was very nice. But there are other places that we know we don't want to go. And yet, this is exactly the place where God says, light has shined. Things have turned around. Things will change for these people and for this land. And God's intention for them is just bring them in. Um, I have no idea how odd this must have sounded to people who felt like they were oppressed by enemies and felt like their very existence was threatened. But there it is. People you don't care about, places you don't want to go, that's exactly where God's light comes into the world. And that's exactly where God's plan becomes real. Um, in the New Testament, we heard the story about Jesus calling disciples. And the story is uh, seen as a fulfillment of this prophet out of the book of Isaiah. Jesus goes up to part of his own nation that is under Roman rule. It has been ruled first by the Greeks and now by Rome. Everybody has built their own cities and used their style of architecture. Jesus' actual place of birth was seen as sort of a, a missionary outpost in this land filled with Gentiles. And that place on the Sea of Galilee where Jesus was, would go, Capernaum, was part of a little narrow strip on that whole sea that it was considered wise for Jewish people to be. He is in the midst of a foreign land. And he has a word to proclaim that doesn't say to just a few people what God's intention is, but it says to everybody, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. God's reality on earth is being made real in the work that I do. And you should turn around and see what it is that God is up to. And he doesn't just say it to people who didn't consider themselves religious. He says it to everybody, even people who were pretty sure they had found a good way to be. Uh, this is a little startling. Repent. Turn around. Think about where you are in your life and know that God expects you to align yourself with the kingdom of heaven for the world. Denise Anderson, the co-moderator of uh, the Presbyterian Church, writes in a recent Christian century, about enemy images, and I quote a large part of her article. The prevailing culture teaches us to use enemy images when we encounter those who have perspectives, practices, and beliefs that are different from our own. But en enemy images, says Marshall Rosenberg, come from the thinking that says there is something wrong with the people whose actions and values we don't agree with. Whether they are antagonistic toward us or not, we decide that their worldview is a threat. Their practices are threatening. They mean us no good, and they're undoing all the work we're trying to do. The gun owner is antagonistic to the anti-gun community activist. The Muslim refugee is a danger to the evangelical citizen. The Democrat is anathema to the Republican. Because they are different, something is wrong with them. When we see people using enemy images, we're creating them in our own image. We're defining them according to our understanding of them, and our understanding is not favorable. 
Yes, real enemies exist. But it's too easy to label others as enemies. The other person becomes an enemy without ever uttering a word or raising a fist. All they need to do is present an opposing view or an alternate way of life. Jesus shows us another way. After his cousin John is arrested and awaits his execution, Jesus starts to show urgency in his ministry. He leaves to go to Galilee, then to Capernaum. He proclaims, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. I'm always struck by the first part, repent. It's not just a command, but also an invitation. It beckons the hearer to turn away from a course of action and choose a new and better way. The call to repent is powerful. It suggests that no one is beyond the reach of redemption and that we all, all, can choose a different path. If we were once the enemy, we need not remain the enemy. I appreciate Pastor Anderson's words and am struck by how easy it is to label someone unknown to us or other than us as enemies. And instead to hear God's call to repentance gives us a new way to look and hear and think about those people. The passage we heard from 1 Corinthians was a letter to a church in trouble. Um, If you go through Corinth's problems, you discover, well, they're having trouble with their fellowship, and they're having trouble with their worship, and they're having trouble with their giving, and they're having trouble with the holiness in their life. And I I look at that list and I go, well, what is it they're doing right? And uh, Paul has a very short list indeed, and it goes something like, I'm really glad Jesus called you guys, but you can do way better than this. I think it's, uh, it's a little bit chastening to think about that community in Corinth. People who were convinced of their goodness in the gospel, but they had so far to go. Um, we should also uh, think about our own lives and figure out the distance we need to travel in order to be a witness to the one who is so faithful to us, the one who turns on the light for the world. One of the paintings that was recovered of Van Gogh was a picture of people leaving the church that his father served in a village there in the Netherlands. And after he painted the picture, he gave it to his mother. And then... After his father died, he took the picture back and he put the leaving congregation in mourning clothes. And I've always thought that was an intriguing thing that the oil painting, even though it seems so fixed, well, it can still be worked on. We may think our lives are fixed, our paths are determined, but we can still be worked on. So repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand.